Okay, uh, guys, I will put up this problem. I want you guys to do it. Just provide a solution to this. Number 47. Let me know what you think about number 47. Oops. Can, can you see the structure at the back? Yes, I will. So I will zoom maybe the first three, then I will I will zoom the first four, then I will switch to number five and six too. So this is straight from your textbook, by the way. Remember, I told you guys that will be very will be textbook friendly this semester. So any solution number one number one oops so that will give a signal right okay so we have one signal here oh, let me use no e. uh, these hydrogens here are the same as this hydrogen over there is that okay but remember there is you have one hydrogen there on each of those carbons, so they will be the same, okay? Uh, here, this hydrogen here will be the same as the hydrogen down there. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, this hydrogen here will also produce a signal, okay? And last but not the least, this set of hydrogens, they will also generate one signal. So who doesn't see why? It's clear for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So how many signals are we going to have there? One, two, three, four, five signals. Okay. So the spectrum will show us five distinct sets of peaks. Okay, that's what we mean by the number of signals. B. What about B? In B, I guess that would be a signal. Okay, uh, I also guess this one here will be a signal, that will be a separate signal. Okay, now next one, you expect these two to also give you a signal. Okay, you also expect these guys to give you a signal. Because techno, we are looking at the environment. If the environments are the same, then last but not the least, this other one here gives us a signal. So, again, I emphasize that is the environment that is important. This hydrogen over here, this hydrogen here, you see the environment is neighboring these two other hydrogens. Now, this other one here will have a different environment. This one here will have a different environment. What I mean by environment, I'm talking about the, high, the neighboring atoms. You see, there are different kinds of neighboring atoms, different kinds of groups. That's what we mean by neighboring environment. Okay. For number three, the hydrogens here will produce a signal different from this one 
a signal that will be different from that one, a signal that will be different from that one. Does that make sense? So over there we have four different signals for number three. They are all CH2, they are all CH2, but they will all give different signals because they all have different environments. Does that make sense? Okay. Number four. How many signals do you expect for number four? How many signals? Perfect. So this and this, they will produce one signal. Is that okay? Uh, this guy here will produce the other signal. So we only have two signals for number four. What about number five? How many signals? We have two signals. This and this will generate one signal and there's a hidden hydrogen here that will generate the second signal. Does that make sense? What about number six? How many signals in number six? How many signals do you expect? Yes, Zion, why? So Zion says three, and he split that molecule into two because he sees the symmetry. Okay, you can see that one half of the molecule is exactly the same as the other half of the molecule. Yes, again, I'm still listening. So what are the three signals? Uh, I guess this will be one here. That hydrogen there. And then the two, uh, the, the two metals on the end will show different signals. Why? Why would they show different signals? Because the environments are not the same. Okay? The environments are not the same. That's why they show different signals. Let me see. Let's see that. If you sometimes it takes time, yeah, when you zoom it, it behaves. If I split the molecule this way, you know, just try to place an imaginary line between the molecule. You will notice that, okay, let's see. Let me draw out this hydrogen here. If I try to draw a plane at that position, what you will notice is that this metal group here is next to this H here. Whereas this metal group here, there is no H down there. So that originates from this carbon. So that's what makes those two metals different. Does that make sense? It makes the two metals different. Look, if I have this molecule inside, if I give you this molecule, with this molecule, the two metal groups are the same. This metal and that metal are the same in this molecule. Because if I decide to split the molecule into two, you will notice that they have exactly the same kind of environment, which is not the case with number six. Does that make sense? So it's important to be able to determine the number of signals each spectrum will produce. Okay. So in the second case, in this situation, we refer to as the hydrogens in this group as being chemically equivalent. That's the way we refer to them. We say they are chemically equivalent, meaning that they have the same chemical environment. Does that make sense? So hydrogens that produce the same signal are referred to as chemically equivalent hydrogens. Okay. So that said, what about number 49A? Let's do number 49A. So number 49 says we should label each set of chemically equivalent proton using A for the set that will be at the lowest frequency in the NMR aspect. No, don't worry about that. Let's just label uh, the protons that will be chemically equivalent. Okay? We don't need to determine which one will be at high or low frequency because that's what we'll do today in class. Labeling chemically equivalent proton in structure A. In structure A, the protons of this melting group and those of this other melting group are chemically equivalent. Does that make sense? They are chemically equivalent because they will generate the same signal. That's why they are chemically equivalent. In structure B, we don't have chemically equivalent protons. They will all be different. Do you see that? They will all give you different signals. 
That's why they are not chemically equivalent. What about C? In C, this and this will be chemically equivalent. They will give you one signal, the same signal. Is that okay? Do we have any other chemically equivalent protein? What about these guys here? What do you think? Would they be chemical equivalent? No. no. Okay? They will not be chemical equivalent because they don't have the same environment. Okay? In D, do we have any chemical equivalent proton in D? I guess no. They will all be different types of protons. Is that okay? What about E? In E, someone says the metal group. I agree. Those metal groups will be chemically equivalent. What about F? F, okay, yeah, F, you can see that this proton here is the same as that proton. Do you see that? Uh, this one will be the same as that one. So we have a set of two chemically equivalent protons in C, uh, in F. Does that make sense? We have a set of two chemically equivalent proton in F. <laughs> okay, you see, that's how easy NMR is. Perfect. So let's continue the class now from where we stopped last time. You remember what we mean by the shielding nuclei and shielded nuclei? You remember that? Okay. It has to do with the electronic environment of a nuclei. If you have a lot of electrons surrounding a nuclei, then we refer to that nuclei as being shielded. If you have fewer electrons surrounding a particular nuclei, then we say the nuclei is deshielded. A nuclei can be deshielded if it is bonded to an electronegative group. Does that make sense? If you bond the nuclei to an electronegative group, that electronegative group will pull electrons towards itself and then deshield that nuclei. So, deshielded nuclei will usually occur at high frequency. Do you see that? Because the frequency is increasing in that direction. So, in the NMR spectrum, the structures that you will see at high frequency usually represent the shielded nuclei. And shielded nuclei will appear at low frequency. Frequency is inverse to the magnetic field. A high frequency implies downfield. Those are terminologies that you should be able to use them interchangeably. Okay? A high frequency implies downfield. And a low frequency implies upfield. Does that make sense? That's where we stopped last time. And then we talked about chemical equivalent signals and all the like and all the like. And we went through a couple of exercises. And today we're looking at a reference. What is the importance of having a reference in life? How is a reference important? How is it important to have a reference? That's a general question. It's not a chemistry question. So that you could. What's the purpose of having a reference? Hmm? And I can't get you. Any, any idea? What's the purpose of having a reference? If you don't have a reference, then you're probably doing something wrong. In life, it's always good to have a reference. You know what? Yeah, if you know the purpose of having a reference, then I would advise everybody to have a reference in life. That's what we call a role model sometimes, you know. Somebody you look up to, that can be a reference. So the purpose of having a reference is for comparison. Does that make sense? That's the purpose of having a reference, because you want to compare things together. That's why you need a reference. Okay? If you want to be a medical doctor, a surgeon, you probably want to look at the greatest surgeon and say, I want to be like him, or I want to be more like him. So you are now using that surgeon as your reference. Okay? If you want to be a chemistry professor in the future, then you can use me, Dr. Zico, as your reference. Okay? 
and say you want to be a better chemistry professor than me. I am your reference. So that's the purpose of having a reference. So it's the same thing with the NMR spectrum. We have a reference in the NMR spectrum. We have a molecule that we can now compare the frequency of your hydrogen versus the frequency of the hydrogen of that particular molecule. And that reference was chosen with specific characteristics, just like you choose your surgeon. Because he's the greatest surgeon on earth, because he's a humble guy, because, 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 that's why I choose him as a reference. So it's the same thing with this molecule called tetramethylsilane. It's chosen as a reference because of certain reasons. Okay? Uh, if you compare silicon and carbon on the periodic table, you will notice that carbon is more electronegative than silicon. And so, the hydrogens in the structure of silicon are highly shielded. Does that make sense? The hydrogens are highly shielded. So, means the hydrogen will resonate at very, very low frequency. And so, very few molecules will actually resonate at that low frequency. Does that make sense? And so we refer, we now re represent that low frequency of TMS as being the reference frequency. And so as the reference frequency, we give him a value of zero, for example. So, okay, that's a zero value. So every frequency will be reported with respect to that reference. Does that make sense? Every value will be reported with respect to that reference. And so, the unit that we use for measuring NMR signal, we refer to that unit as a part per million, which is technically another way of looking at frequency. And so, TMS is given a value of zero part per million. Does that make sense? Any other proton now will be given in terms of that. So, if I give you a signal, I say that signal appears at five part per million. It means that it's simply five part per million away from the reference molecule. That's the way you should see. It. Does that make sense? And so, in order to compare things, you now have that comparison formula. Okay? The frequency of the operating instrument, remember you're using an NMR instrument, and over here is the distance from TMS meaning your frequency away from TMS divided by the frequency of the instrument, gives you what we refer to as the chemical shift, which is the unit that we use to measure the signals in an NMR spectrum. So the chemical shift of a molecule is a distance downfield from TMS. So your distance away from TMS divided by the operating frequency. Why is this important? Why is this chemical shift important? Because the value of the chemical shift does not depend on the frequency of the instrument. Does that make sense? So the value of the chemical shift does not depend on the frequency of your instrument. So if you have a proton that has a chemical shift of 4.2 part per million in a 60 megahertz instrument, that same proton will also have a chemical shift of 4.2 megahertz in a 1000 megahertz instrument. Does that make sense? So the chemical shift value doesn't change, irrespective of the frequency of the instrument. Does that make sense, guys? So that's what we refer to as the chemical shift. Okay. Yeah, this is your first NMR spectrum. That's how a typical NMR spectrum look like. Okay, so how many signals do we have in this spectrum? Okay, so we have two signals in this spectrum. We have this signal and we have that other signal. This one here is the reference signal, TMS. That's why the value is at zero. Okay, here. That's our reference signal, the value is at zero. So we just simply use that as a reference. CMS. Okay. And now the first signal is about one part per million from the reference. The second signal is about what? What is it? Maybe 3.2. It's about 3.2 part per million away from uh, CMS. Does that make sense? That's the way we look at it. Uh, let's call this one signal. No, let me call it B. 
let's call this signal B and then let's call that signal A. And so you will say here that in this spectrum that A is shielded. Photon A is a more shielded compared to photon B. So photon B are the shielded and photon A are shielded. That's the kind of language we'll be using. Does that make sense? It means that proton A is having a lot of electron density around itself compared to proton B. What can be the reason? What can be the reason why proton B is having fewer electron density? So most likely proton B is bonded to an electronegative atom. Does that make sense? So that's the way I want you to start thinking about this kind of thing. So if you have to compare the environment of A and the environment of B, you will most likely, even without seeing the structure, because that's the purpose of NMR, for us to be able to come up with the structure. Even without seeing the structure, you can now guess that, okay, because B is shielded than A, it means that B is most likely connected to an electronegative group. Does that make sense? B is most likely connected to an electronegative group. And so if you look at the structure, if you look at the structure of that molecule, we have two signals because this, this, and this will all generate one signal. Does that make sense? Those three metal groups will all generate one signal. And then this other group here will generate the other signal. That's why you see two signals. So which of them is A, which of them is B? So we expect the red is most likely to be B. Is that okay? So the red signal is most likely to be B and the blue is most likely to be A. Does that make sense up to this point? Okay. Yes. So the um, B has a lower resonance frequency? Is it frequency? No. B has a higher resonance frequency. Remember that frequency increases. When you are shielded, it means high frequency. When you are shielded, it means low frequency. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it says here again, the greater the chemical shift, the higher the frequency. Does that make sense? The greater the, free, the, the chemical shift, the higher the frequency. So if I say high frequency, it means high chemical shift. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is the number of metal groups correlated to the height of the length of that one? Yes, we'll get to that. Yes. We'll call that the integration. We'll probably get to that by the end of the class. Yes. Nice. Yes. What is the operating frequency of the spectrometer? The of this spectrometer, I don't know. I don't know. For this for this particular the one that generated this signal, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I don't know the operating frequency of this one. Well, maybe in the future we'll, I think we'll get to something similar like that. Yeah, so in a summary, the terms that you guys need to remember, you have it here, okay? This is a summary. The chemical shift increases with the frequency. And so, proton in electron poor environment versus proton in electron rich environment. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Proton in electron poor environment versus proton in electron rich environment. So, when you are in an electron poor environment, we refer to you as being the shielded proton. We say you are downfield. We say you have a high frequency. And we say you also have a large chemical shift. So those are all the terms used to describe a proton in an electron poor environment. All the terms used to describe electrons in an electron dense environment. We say that proton is shielded. You can also say the proton appears upfield because the magnetic field moves in opposite direction to the frequency. Then you can say that proton is having a low frequency, low resonance frequency. And you can also say the proton has a small chemical shift, delta, small chemical shift value. So those are the terms that you should familiarize yourself with when you're talking about enema. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, do this. You remember the formula, right? The formula say chemical shift equals to distance 
from TMS divided by operating frequency of the instrument. That's what the chemical shift is. Distance from TMS divided by operating frequency of the instrument. So if you know that, then you can do the math easily and get the answer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. Have a lot of people that need to do their math correctly. Huh? So a lot of people need to do their math correctly. So the chemical shift, the chemical shift is seven point two, right? Chemical shift is seven point two. Equal the distance. That's what we are looking for. So we are looking for the distance. So let's call that x. Divided by the operating frequency. What's the operating frequency? 60. So what's the value of X, guys? 7.2 multiplied by 60. Does that make sense? That would be the value of X. 7.2 multiplied by 60. So what that, well, I think that would be high value. The only high value I have there is B. Okay? The only high value I have there is B. Are we good, guys? Perfect. So the relative position of the signal, we already have an idea what the relative position of the signal is, what can affect the relative position of a signal. So we have a hypothetical molecule here. This molecule will probably be named... Uh, what would be the name of this molecule, by the way? I don't even know. That's the nitro group, right? So that would be nitropropane. Okay, nitropropane or oh, pro propyl nitrate whatsoever, nitrate. Oh. No, nitrate will be C N. Okay. Yeah, not N O two. So that will be nitropropane. Okay. So this is a molecule nitropropane. So we already know that this molecule will generate three signals. Okay, based on the structure, because we see three different types of hydrogens. I'm not saying that it has three hydrogen, three different types. Okay. So because we see three different types of hydrogen, we know it will generate three signals. And now you see the values of the signals are represented there. We have one at 4.1.0, 2.07, and 4.37. So they have different chemical shifts. Okay. And now, by now, I expect you guys to be able to guess why the chemical shifts are different. So this other guy here, this first hydrogen here, with a chemical shift of 4.37, is that downfill or upfill? So that's downfill, meaning that it is deshielded. Does that make sense? It means it's deshielded, and it's deshielded simply because it is next to, to the nitro group. The nitro group is an electron withdrawing group. Does that make sense? So that's why it's deshielded. That electron withdrawing group will deshield it. It will make it downfill. It will make it resonate at high frequency. Does that make sense? And then the guy, the CH3, is having a chemical shift of 1.04 because it's far away from the electron withdrawing group. So it is shielded. So the further away you are from the electron withdrawing group, the more shielded you are. Does that make sense? And so that's why this guy will have a signal around 1.0. And so if you look, if we draw a hypothetical NMR spectrum from that for that molecule, you will probably have three signals like this. One would be around one, the other one around two, the other around around four. Does that make sense? So you will see three distinct sets of signals on that NMR spectrum. Is that okay, guys? We are building the puzzle bit by bit. Okay, we are getting there bit by bit. 
I guess you guys can read in English, right? So read that sentence for yourself. You will basically repeat what I'm saying. So these are, well, the structures are very small, but this is simply the same thing we've discussed both. As electronegativity increases, the frequency of the signals for nearby hydrogen atom increases. That is logic, right? If you have a molecule with high electronegativity, you expect it to be pulling electrons stronger than a molecule with a relatively low electronegativity. Does that make sense? And so, it would take example, if we look at these two structures here. Uh, the first one is called 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1 fluoropentane, and the other one is called 1 chloropentane. They are basically similar molecules. The only difference is between chlorine and fluorine. Okay? And we are looking at a particular hydrogen. The hydrogen that is standing next to the electronegative group. And you can see that their chemical shifts are different. And the difference in their chemical shift is simply because one is connected to fluorine, which is more electronegative than chlorine. And so the one connected to fluorine will have a higher chemical shift. Does that make sense? Because fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. Is that okay? So fluorine will pull electron, will de-shield that hydrogen more than chlorine will do. Is that okay? You can do the same comparison between chlorine and bromine. Chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, and so chlorine will de-shield greater than bromine will do. Does that make sense? Okay. And you can also extend that comparison to iodine. You can also extend the comparison to iodine. Okay. <clears throat> Approximate values of chemical shift. So you guys have this table. So this table gives you, well, like a general range, a general way of appreciating what the chemical shift are. I'm not asking you to memorize it. No, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to memorize this, but I'm trying to ask you guys to be able to do pattern recognition, to be able to recognize a pattern. Okay? That's what I want you guys to be able to do. Let's look at the table, what I mean by uh, recognizing the pattern. Okay. Now, let's look at an example like these three proteins. Well, I think we'll talk about it in detail. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. I think I have a slide that will talk about it in detail. So this gives you kind of like a general idea of where protons appear. In a typical enema, most signal for what we should do in this class, signals will be found between zero chemical shift and a maximum of 12, 13 chemical shift will hardly go beyond 13. Hardly. In short, most of the things are found between 0 and 8. Exceptions, you know, will be more than 8. If you have a signal more than 8, it's easy to guess what you have in a molecule. So, the most interesting part that will mostly focus our time will be between 0 and 8. And if you look at these, these signals are kind of like round between 0 and 8, except, for example, this guy and this guy that are a little bit higher than 8. Those are the exceptions. But most of them are between 0 and 8, and they have defined regions where you can find them. So if you see a signal around a particular region, then you can guess what that molecule can be. For example, if you have signal between 0 and 1.5, then it most likely means that they belong to hydrogen connected to a saturated carbon. You know what a saturated carbon is? An sp3 carbon. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's what we call a saturated carbon. So signals between 0 and 1.5 most likely belong to hydrogen connected to an sp3 carbon. Does that make sense? Signal between 1.5 and 2.5 most likely belong to those kind of hydrogen. You see, they've drawn the partial structure. They've shown you the partial structure. So most likely, a hydrogen that is next to a carbonyl group or a hydrogen that is, uh, how do we call this kind of hydrogen? Allylic. A hydrogen next to a carbon-carbon double bond, an allylic hydrogen. Signal between 2.5 and 4.5, most likely a hydrogen connected to an electronegative atom. It could be oxygen, it could be nitrogen, it could be chlorine, it could be fluorine. You know, they will always appear between 2.5 and 4.7. Okay? And interestingly, signal between 6.5 and 8.0, 
and most likely aromatic signal, meaning signals of hydrogen connected to a benzene ring. Okay, high chances are that those protons belong to a benzene ring. That's the beginning, that's the way we start. So by looking at the region where they appear, it already gives you an idea of what the structure will be. Okay. Now, so these are, uh, yeah, remember I told you when we were on this table, I wanted to use this example, then I said I have it in detail. So let's try to understand why these chemical shifts are different. Okay, that's what we have to do in the next slide. We need to understand that a little bit. So we have three different groups of proton. This is a CH3, this is a CH2, and this is a CH. Okay, so those are two different groups. So we have, in other words, a primary carbon, uh, a secondary carbon, and a tertiary carbon. Do you see that? Okay, primary carbon because it's connected to one other carbon, secondary carbon because it's connected to two other carbon, and tertiary carbon because it's connected to three other carbons. Okay, so we refer to them as the methyl, the methylene, and the methane protons. So protons of a tertiary carbon are referred to as methane, protons of a secondary carbon are referred to as methylene, and that of a primary as metal. So why are their chemical shifts different? Carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. That's the answer. Does that make sense? Carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So the more carbons you have, the greater what? The pulling of those electrons. And so the hydrogen becomes more deshielded. And if they are more deshielded, the chemical shifts are higher. Does that make sense? That's the explanation. So with the tertiary hydrogen, the tertiary hydrogen is surrounded by three carbons, and so it shift that hydrogen more. That's why the chemical shifts around 1.55. Whereas the primary carbon is connected to only around one carbon, and so the shielding of this hydrogen is not that great. That's why the chemical shift is at 0.85. Does that make sense, guys? So that's the way I want you guys to think. Not to memorize this value, but to be able to come out with a rationale why it appears around the region where it does. Does that make sense? Why does it appear around that region? That's what is important for now. And with that, we should be able to now guess their relative position. We should be able to guess. So as a rule of thumb, usually we will use this alphabetical uh, nomenclature A, B, C, D. A will usually represent protons that are shielded, and Z will represent protons that are deshielded. Does that make sense? So whenever you see label it as proton A, it means that it is deshielded compared to proton uh, A. Oh, sorry. It is shielded at low chemical shift. Is that okay? So we'll be using it as a universal, you know, for us. That's the way we'll use it. So in this structure, uh, butanone, in the structure butanone, we all believe that there will be three signals. And the three signals are A, B, and C. You will have three signals, A, B, and C. So A will be the shielded signal, meaning that the value, the chemical shield value of A will be around, you know, closer to zero. Does that make sense? The chemical shift value of A will be closer to zero. According to our table, this is a CH3 here. And according to the table here, a CH3 that is saturated, it will be what? Closer to zero. So the value will be somewhere between zero and 1.5 for A. Does that make sense? Now, uh, if we move forward, what about B? Look at B. B, look at the neighbor. The neighbor is a carbonyl group. Do you see that? Neighbor is a carbonyl group. Then according to this table, B will appear between what? B will appear here, right? Look at it, clean. B will appear between 1.5 and 2.5. Look, because this is the kind of thing we have in B. Neighboring a carbon double bond oxygen. Is that okay? 
And so if we go down to the next structure, C. C also will appear kind of the same region with B. Do you see that? Because C is also neighboring a carbon double bond oxygen. C is also neighboring a carbon double bond oxygen. Is that okay? 2-methoxypropane. 2-methoxypropane will have a total of three signals. We have the A signals that will appear at low chemical shift, downfield, low chemical shift. Then we have a B and the C signal. Okay, if you have the slide next to you, where do you think B and C will appear? About what chemical shift from the slide? Look at the uh, look at the table. Go back to the table. Go back to that table. B and C, where would they appear? Around what value? I'm talking about this. Where would B and C appear? About which chemical shape? Who? Someone is speaking around there. Between where? Between 2.5 and 4.5. Does that make sense? So B and C, there will be no C signal around that region between 2.5 and 4.5. Because they are next to an oxygen. Do you see that? So there will be somewhere there. There will be somewhere there. That's where D and C will be. Okay? Those guys. There will be somewhere there. But then, let's look at them again critically. Between B and C, which one will be at a relatively higher chemical shift than the other? Between B and C. Huh? Which one will be at a higher frequency? C will be at a higher frequency, okay? C will be at a higher frequency, then B will be a little bit lower frequency. And the reason is clear, because C is also connected to our other carbon. That carbon kind of like shield it more. Does that make sense? It's not only shielded by O, but it's also a little bit shielded by those carbon. Does that make sense? That's why it appears as slightly higher frequency than B. Does that make sense? That's the way I want you guys to think about this thing. That's the way I want you guys to think about it. Another region of interest. Another region of interest are the sp2 carbons. Remember, sp2 are the double bonds. So hydrogens that are connected to double bonds. Hydrogens that are connected to double bonds. So the chemical shift of proton attached to sp2 carbon appears at higher frequency than the loop, than the one we will predict and we'll talk about why we'll talk about why very soon why uh, those chemical shift appears at that position okay now aromatic proton meaning the ones connected to a benzene ring their chemical shift will always be around seven remember i said it will be between 6.5 and 8.5 so usually if you see a signal there then most likely we have a benzene ring okay now this hydrogen here is connected to a double bond and this other hydrogen here are also connected to a double bond but look at their signal you see that's a big gap one is at seven the other one is at four and then this other hydrogen is also connected to a carbon that has a double bond directly connected look at where the signal is 9.0 you see it's like a wide range then it means that there's something happening does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It means that there is something happening. Because they are all connected to an sp2 carbon. Although they are connected to the sp2 carbon, but you see that the range is really wide. Remember I said we'll only be studying between 0 and 12. And so if you have that kind of wide range for the sp2 carbon, it means there's something wrong. And so we'll talk about that something wrong. Why is that wide range? Why do we have the wide range? So all that has to do with what we call the diamagnetic anisotropy. Ah, God. Don't worry about too much, eh? Don't worry too much about these terms. It's just, it's just to make you guys understand. Nothing fancy. We refer to that as a diamagnetic anisotropy. Let's go back to the first lecture. Remember we said we have a nuclear. And that nuclear is surrounded by electrons. As the electron move around the nuclear, they generate a magnetic field, okay? And that magnetic field can either oppose or align with your external magnetic field. Does that make sense? If it aligns with the external magnetic field, 
you have a lower energy. If it opposes the external magnetic field, you have a high energy. Does that make sense? That's what we said in the first class. That was the lesson of the first class. But now when you look at a benzene ring, it has a pi bond. It means it has pi electron. It is rich in electron. The benzene ring technically is flat. You know, it's a flat ring. And you have a cloud of electron above the ring, another cloud of electron below the ring. And so those electrons are moving. As they are moving, they generate a certain current. And this is how the direction of the current is. That's the direction of the current. Just like what you see in the picture. So those red lines are the direction of the magnetic field current, the field current generated by the electrons of the benzene ring. Now, the question is, where do the hydrogen stand with respect to that current? Okay. So on the benzene ring, the hydrogens are exactly in this position. And if you look at the direction of the electron current at that particular position, look at the direction of the electron current. At this point, the electron current is moving upward. Do you see that? And it is in the same direction with your magnetic field. This is your external magnetic field. And you see that the direction of the electron current for that hydrogen is aligning with the external magnetic field. And so if they align together, they will have a lower energy. Does that make sense? So that's why the chemical shift. That's why uh, they will appear at a higher frequency. They will resonate faster. Let me put it that way. So because they align, they resonate faster. Is that okay? This is just for understanding. This is just for appreciation. Let's look at the alkene. In terms of the alkene, those pi electrons also generate a certain electron current. They also generate a certain electron current. And when you compare the direction of that electron current with your applied magnetic field, they also align with each other. They also align with each other. And so they will also resonate at a relative higher frequency. Is that okay, guys? Same thing with the carbon here. So everything depends on the strength of that current. If that current perfectly aligns with the external magnetic field, the frequency becomes higher. As the alignment decreases, that's how the frequency also lowers. Does that make sense? As the alignment decreases, the frequency also becomes lower. Don't worry too much about it. Exception to the rule. It always exists. Exception to the rules are the SP carbon, meaning triple bonds. Okay, exception to the rules are the triple bonds. If you look at the hydrogen in a triple bond, if you look at the hydrogen in a triple bond, look at the direction of the current there. You see the current is going downward. So the hydrogens of the triple bond is located in the region where the current is going downward. And so the current is going in the opposite direction to your magnetic field. Does that make sense? Going in the opposite direction to your magnetic field. And so the hydrogen is mean, it means that the hydrogen is shielded. Okay, it means the hydrogen is shielded, and if it is shielded, it will appear at low frequency. That's the exception to the rule. So, you expect sp hydrogen to have a lower chemical shift than sp2 hydrogen. That's the reason because the direction of the electron current is opposite to that of the external magnetic field. Let's take a break.
Is Popio the Jeepan Queen? Oh, okay, it's cool. So, what is the answer? Okay. Why not B? Oh, sorry, why not E? Why is E not the answer? Okay, because bromine is a, a less electronegative, right? Bromine is less electronegative than fluorine. Does that make sense? Yeah. You guys should go and you guys should drink coffee. Save a cup of class. Drink coffee and then that will be you the... Or you sleep early, you know, Monday night. Make sure by 8 p.m. you go to bed. Which game? The LSU game? Well, it should not interest us because we never get to that level. So what should we worry about right now? You know, in life you need to know your position in life. You know? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that you should lower your expectations. Let's face fact. Let's face fact. When do you think Hampton will be national champion for basketball? And so, you see, that's just being realistic. You understand what I mean? It's, it's been, it's, remember the beginning of class, I told you guys to have a reference. Man, how does you not have LSU as a reference? Because it's hard to get there. You know, it's really hard to get there. You know, it's, it would be nice to have them as reference, but you know, let's face fact. So, your reference also should be realistic. Okay? <laughs> Your reference also should be realistic. Those are the lessons of life. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes it's also good to have unrealistic references. Because a lot of good things have happened with people who have unrealistic beliefs. You know. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if I can continue pumping you guys with NMR, NMR information. So I'm going to your textbook. This is your textbook. You, let's go back to your textbook. Number 51. Number 51. Let's look at number 51 from your textbook. It says, how can the proton enema... How can the proton enema distinguish between the compound in each of the following pairs? Let's do A and B only. Okay. How can the proton enema distinguish between the pair of molecule A and A? How will you use enema to distinguish them? Yes. Let, let, let's see. Let's see. Hold on. Let me let me give you structure one. And structure two. Okay. Louder, louder. Okay. Well, it's a number of peaks. That's good. But how many peaks does structure one have? Four. Is that okay? Yeah. So the NMR spectrum of structure one will show four peaks. One, two, three, four. Does that make sense? Whereas the NMR spectrum of structure 2 will show you two peaks. So that's how you can be able to distinguish between those two structures. Does that make sense? How would you distinguish between the structures in B? Okay. How will you distinguish between the structures in B? I will focus on these hydrogens here. Does that make sense? That would be my point of focus. Because the chemical sheets of those hydrogens will be hugely different. One is connected to bromine, another one is connected to nitrogen. Between nitrogen and bromine, which one is more electronegative? Look at your periodic table. Nitrogen and bromine, which one is more electronegative? Nitrogen. When I keep repeating, it means that you are wrong. Does that make sense? So nitrogen is more electronegative. 
So you will look at those problems. So this guy will have a higher frequency, high chemical shift compared to this one. Does that make sense? And again, you can also look at the number of signals. That can be another point of interest. Here, this and this gives you one signal, and this will give you another signal. So you will have a total of two signals in this molecule. Does that make sense? You will have only two signals here, whereas here you will have more than two. One, two, three signals. Does that make sense? That's how you can use enema to ascertain that you have something or not. Is that okay? So if you have an enema of these two compounds and you don't know which one, so you can use that kind of stuff to distinguish between them. What about C? What about C? In C, I can still use the number of signals. Let's see if we can use the number of signals. I'm not very sure. If I split this, I notice that both halves are exactly the same. Do you see that? I notice that both halves are exactly the same. So this and this gives me one signal, and this one gives me the other signal. So I will have two signals in the first structure, on the first structure, or for the first structure. Then what about the other one? This, this, this will give me one signal. Is that okay? This one will give me another signal. And this one gives me another signal. So it will be a two signal structure versus a three signal structure. Does that make sense? Yes, yes that's how you can use NMR. Finish the rest. It's on the inside your textbook. Use your textbook. Because if you don't finish it, I will finish it in the exam. Oh. <laughs> uh? So, uh, earlier on in class, she asked me a question. Kari asked me a question about the height of the signal. You remember the question? She asked me something in class today. She was like, uh, does the height of the signal, is the height of the signal proportional to the number of hydrogen? And I answer, Karina, what did I answer? Oh, yeah. I said yes, okay. The height of the signal is proportional to the number of hydrogen generated by that signal. Okay, so if you have a CH2, the height of the CH2 will be different from the height of the CH3. Because the CH3 will have three hydrogens, so it will give us a taller signal. Whereas the other one, the CH2, will give us a relatively shorter signal. That, we refer to that as the integral. We say it's integration. So the integral gives you information about the number of hydrogen generated by the signal. Does that make sense? That's what the integral is. So we, now we are looking, this is a second property that we are looking in the spectrum. The first thing, we look at the environment, the relative position. That was the first thing. Now we are looking at the height of the signal. Okay, the height of the signal is proportional to the number of hydrogen that generate the signal. Does that make sense? And we refer to that as the integration. And it can be expressed as the number of hydrogens, or it can be expressed as a ratio. Does that make sense? It can be expressed as a ratio, or it can be expressed as the number of hydrogen. So for example, what we have here, right now, is expressed as a ratio. What we have here is expressed as a ratio, it's not expressed as the number of hydrogen. Oh, sorry, is it? Yeah, this is expressed as a ratio right now. Okay, it says it is 1.6 is to 7. This is expressed as a ratio. So it means that here you have uh, about 1.6 hydrogens, whereas here you have about 7 hydrogens. That's the ratio. And you remember in this structure, we said the taller signal, we call this A and we call this B. Okay, and we call this B. So this is B, and these are the guys responsible for A. So in other words, another way you could represent this ratio, you could say you have a 9 is to 2. That's another way of representing it. In that case, you've represented it in terms of the number of hydrogen. It means that this signal is generated by 2 hydrogen, whereas this signal is generated by a total of 9 hydrogen. 
Does that make sense? So you can express it as a ratio, or you can express it as the number, the exact number of hydrogen. Either way, you will be able, you will see that, and so you should familiarize yourself with both of them. That's what we refer to as the integral. That's how important the integral is. So when I see an integration of two, it most likely it is most likely that I have a CH2. If I see an integration of three, what do you think of? CH3. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if you see an integration of six, what can you think of? You can have two CH3, right? Mm -hmm. Integration of six, two CH3, or three CH2s, or six CH1. But if you have six CH1, it means that all those CH1 should be the same. You should have the same chemical shape. Mm -hmm. If you have three CH2, it means that three CH2s will have the same chemical environment for you to give you the same sigma. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Now, in this our case, we have nine, an integration of nine. It means that we have three CH3s that have exactly the same chemical environment. Does that make sense? That's the meaning of integration. That's how important integration is. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, so you're saying the, uh, the bigger signal is a 7 plus the 1.6? No. 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 That's 1.6 yes. and 7 is the integration in terms of ratio. Remember I said the integration can be in terms of ratio or it can be in terms of the number of hydrogens directly. Uh, so if it's given in terms of ratio, you need to do a little bit of mathematics to find the number of hydrogens. You need to do a little bit of algebra. Is that okay? If it's given in terms of ratio, you do a little bit of algebra. Let's do that algebra here. So, when the signal is given in terms of ratio, like it's the case here, 1.6 is to 7. So here, we need to find the number of hydrogen. It would be the ratio, that integral, 1.6, divided by the total integral. What would be the total integral? 1.6 plus 7. Does that make sense? It will be that integral divided by the total integral multiplied by the total number of hydrogens in the system. How many hydrogens do we have in the system? 11. Does that make sense? We have 11 hydrogen. 3, 3, 3, and 2. So multiply by the total number of hydrogen in the system. So when you do this math, what do you have? I don't know. You'll probably have 2. Does that make sense? And so the one for seven, you do the same thing. It will be seven divided by oh, seven divided by one point six plus seven, multiplied by the total number of hydrogen, and that should give you nine hydrogen. So when you have the ratio, when you are given the integration in terms of ratio, that's what you do. If you are given integration in terms of the hydrogen, that's fine. Then you can just use it directly. So familiarize yourself with both methods, okay? Integration can be given in either way, either way. So the area under each signal is proportional to the number of protons that the signal produces. That's what we refer to as the integral, okay? And so, and so in this molecule, in this particular molecule, the integral for 1,1-dichloroethane, if you look at the NMR of 1,1-dichloroethane, it will be an NMR with two signals. Does that make sense? We will have a spectrum with two signals. This will be signal A, and that will be signal B. Signal A is having three hydrogens, so the peak will be like that. And signal B with one hydrogen, we expect the peak to probably be like this. Does that make sense? And so... This will be B, and that will be A. So, A will be about three times taller than B is. Does that make sense? Is that okay for everyone? 1,2-dichloro-2-methylpropane. 1,2-dichloro-2-methylpropane. We we'll also have a total of two hydrogens, or I mean two signals, because this signal and this signal are the same, which is different from that one. Okay, so we have a total of two signals. And the ratio of those signals will also be a ratio of 1 is to 3. Does that make sense? Or 2 is to 6. 
That's what the integration will be. Any question? I don't want to do the next slide. That would be too much information. Yes, ma'am. How to calculate the stop based on ratio? Let me see if the textbook have a problem. I don't want us to do the next slide because that's a, that's another property of the spectrum. So far, we've talked about two things. We can look in this. I will get back to your question. So far, we've talked about two things. Okay, we've talked about the relative position in the spectrum, meaning the chemical environment, and we've also talked about the integration. Okay, in the future, we'll talk about splitting. My class is not over. Remember, I still have five or six minutes. We'll talk about splitting, but I don't want us to talk about it right now. That would be good for next class. Let's go back to the textbook and see if I can answer her question based on the textbook. Uh -huh. Let's do number 53. We'll, we'll get to it integral. I will not forget. I will not forget. But I like number 53. Let's do number... I don't know if you guys can see it because I cannot show the full everything completely. So this question in number 53, we have a different spectra given to us. Three, three spectra given to us and we are asked to match the proton NMR spectra with one of the following compounds. So a series of compounds are given to us. Okay. And so we are required to match. Let's use the knowledge we have so far to do the matching. Okay. In spectrum one, we have two signals. Does that make sense? We have two signals. One there and one here. Uh, we can look at the integration giving us the number of hydrogens. Uh, I need. Yeah, if you look at the integration, the ratio of the number of protons is 1 is to 6. That's the integration. Okay, 1 is to 6. So, those are the ratios. Let's see if we can match the structures. Among these structures, which one do you think will be the best one? The last one, right? The last one will most likely correspond to this spectrum. Can everyone see that? Who cannot see? Who cannot see? Tell me. You better die now than to die on my exam day. Because <laughs> okay. if you die now, there is opportunity for resurrection. <laughs> but if you die on my exam day, then we will only bury you and forget. Yes. Does that make sense? So who doesn't understand why is that one? So it matches, right? Mm -hmm. That one will give us two signals and the protons are actually one is to six also. Is that okay? One is to six. One is to six. Uh, what about B? B we have... Oh, we're getting into more details now. We're getting into more details. So B we have three signals. Does that make sense? B we have three signals, meaning we have three different types of proton. Ah, I hate when it does this. And so in terms of the ratio, two, two, three... 2, 2, 3. I'll be tempted to say CH2, CH2, CH3. Does that make sense? 2, 2, 3. So let's go back here. Which one can that be? Does that make sense? It will most likely be this one. You see that? CH2, CH2, CH3. Is that okay? Based on what we've done. See how knowledgeable you guys are already in NMR? That's how much knowledge you guys know already. Yeah. Man, it hurts me to give you guys three minutes like that. I feel so bad. You guys should go. Bye-bye.